Welcome to this webinar on the responsible use of metrics. As comic book fans will know, the title is a slight play on the quote from Spider-Man, but sadly for any fans out there, this is as far as I'm going to be taking that theme today. I'd really like to spend the time we have talking about superheroes, but we're here to talk about metrics and how they're used to measure research in a responsible way. To do that, we're going to cover the following three topics that you see there on the screen the sort of current system and why it needs to change, one possible solution in the form of the responsible metrics movement with a closer look at why responsible metrics are important and what's actually being done to support their use, and then finally how library staff can work to support their research community with using responsible metrics. Before we look at responsible metrics in any depth, it's important to know where all this is coming from, so we're going to start with a quick recap on metrics and the current situation. No doubt you'll know that metrics are numerical measures which are used to assess the quality and impact of research. In the context of research support, there are two main types of metric that library staff are likely to be concerned with, biblio and alt metrics. Bibliometrics are the ones that most people will have heard of. These involve the statistical analysis of publications and other outputs and include metrics like citation counts, the H index and the journal impact factor. A lot of these metrics are kind of entrenched in academia and it can be very hard to get researchers and academics to let go of that. They're quantitative measures and so very focused on the numbers without really looking at anything else. So many people have argued that they can be a little bit misleading. Alt metrics were created in 2010 as a way to counter some of the problems of traditional bibliometrics. Perhaps the biggest problem is that traditional metrics were designed for a world dominated by print publication and it's becoming increasingly difficult to measure the sort of newer types of output like social media posts. Alt metrics look at a range of sources used to share research and it gives them a different weighting depending on its potential impact. So a news story who's going to be seen by more people would have a higher weighting than a social media post. The result is a number and then something that's known as the alt metric donut, which is a sort of color coded wheel showing where an output has been mentioned with each different type of um, output or sharing platform is a different colour. Altmetrics also allow you to look at what's actually been said about something, which is something that traditional bibliometrics can't do. So you can click on the tweet, for example, and um, drill down and see what someone has actually said about the research, good or bad. Between these two categories, there are lots of different metrics which are used to measure different levels of output. So the model we're going to look at is from a book called Meaningful Metrics. It's by people called Roma and Borchardt, and you'll see the reference on the bottom of the screen there. It's a really useful model because it highlights the different levels of measurement that you can measure with metrics. The first level is what's known as the individual scholarly contribution. So that's the output of a research project, such as a journal article or a book chapter, something like that. Obviously, the range of output options has increased dramatically in recent years, and authors can produce a range of contributions from just one single project. So they can do um, a journal article, a lit review, a conference presentation, a blog post, all sorts of things. And each of those has its own metrics attached to it. The next level is something the authors refer to as the venues of production. So this is talking about the title or the format of the publication. So for example, the journal title that an article is published in, so the name of the journal, Nature, for example. Researchers will often consider things like the impact factor of a particular journal when they're thinking about where they want to publish, and that's often one of the major parts of their decision making, rightly or wrongly. Of course, we have individual authors this is the next level. These are also measured, and how individual researchers perform is often taken into account when institutions look at things like promotion and tenure and those really important um, life decisions about your career. There's a whole range of metrics dedicated to measuring authors at different stages of their careers as well. And metrics for individual authors can be really different depending on the calculation used to calculate that particular metric. It can be a bit confusing. The final level that people will probably be aware of is groups and institutions, which obviously measures the impact of the wider institution that the researcher belongs to. This might be measured in terms of, say, um, how many researchers publish in high impact journals from that group, or how often people from a certain department are cited by peers, or even the ranking of one university compared to another. 
So what you see now on the screen is a slightly stupid example of um, that put into practice, but it helps to illustrate the point. So if you had Dr. Snickers of Candy University, he or she has written a paper published in the Journal of Chocolate Studies. Each of these four levels of metrics can be assessed on its own. So you could look at the output of Dr. Snickers, the output of Candy University, the um, the impact factor of Journal of Chocolate Studies and whether um, the article is actually having any impact or they can be combined. So you could look at how many um, people from Candy University have actually published in the High Impact Journal of Chocolate Studies or how the, the metrics of that one article contribute to Dr. Snicker's profile overall. And this will um, bring together a, a picture of impact of all the different things or whether you're trying to measure one or all of them in combination. So hopefully that sort of illustrates how the levels model works. It should be quite obvious from that discussion that metrics are a really important part of the research life cycle and the implications of measurement are really present at every different point of the research life cycle from the idea right through to the sharing and summing up at the end. Researchers quite often now have to outline the potential impact of a project when they're filling in their grant application, which unless they're clairvoyant can be quite hard to do. And then when they've finished everything and everything's been shared and it's out there, they'll need to add metrics on these outputs to their CV, so at a personal level. On the screen, you can see a summary of some of the most common uses of metrics in academia, and we're just going to go through those now. Rightly or wrongly, metrics are often used as a substitute to judge the quality of research. So the idea being if it has more citations, it's better research, no matter really what the content of these citations is. And we'll look at why this is a bit of a problem further on in the webinar. Researchers often rely on the metrics of a publisher or journal title to decide who they're going to approach, where they're actually going to publish their findings. They're going to want to publish in titles which have the biggest impact as they think this will be beneficial to their career in the long run and help them to get more work and greater respect within their discipline. And whether that's a good idea or not, it's, it's true. And that is what happens in uh, real life, unfortunately. Many institutions will also use metrics as the basis of performance reviews and benchmarking exercises. So both for the individual researcher, for the department and the whole institution. So if you, you're called into your yearly review, your boss might say to you, well, I see that, you know, you've published X number of papers in a high impact journal or you've not done very well and you've not got many citations this year, that kind of thing. There have been some stories of institutions sort of giving encouragement to their researchers to publish in certain titles. So, for example, there's a journal called Nature, which is highly sought after as it's one of the highest impact journals in the sciences. And it has something like a 92 percent, I think it is, rejection rate. So it's very, very competitive to get in. There have been some claims online that some institutions will pay authors up to um, $20,000 if they have a paper published in Nature. So that's the lead author, the, the first person named on the paper. We've got $20,000. So I mean, that's quite an incentive. Not advocating that that's right. That is just what um, some people will do. So you can kind of see the competitiveness that it's drawing out already. Linked to this, of course, is the use of metrics to advance the individual researcher's career. So somebody's metric scores are often consulted as part of the hiring process quite often these are available online somewhere they're certainly not that hard to dig up if you've got any kind of academic social networking presence and the better the metric someone has achieved realistically the more likely it is they'll be considered for a job or a promotion this is particularly an issue in the us where certain metrics are heavily emphasized during what's known as the tenure process and the more impact someone has had, the more likely they are to secure a, a permanent academic position, which is a bit like gold dust these days. These are obviously really major decisions we're talking about here. They can have impacts on lives and careers and whole institutions. And they're being made quite often on the basis of metrics. But I think we need to take a step back and ask ourselves whether this should actually be the case. Metrics as a measurement tool obviously have a place, they have their uses, 
but they also have some limitations which you can see here on the slide. So most of the metrics that are commonly used today in academia are what's known as quantitative measures, which means they put a lot of emphasis on numbers over any other measure of impact. Numbers are obviously part of the story, quite a big part of the story, but I think it's important to realise that you need to look at other impacts as well. So a good example of this that I often use is um, something everyone else often uses. It's an Andrew Wakefield paper from the late 1990s which linked autism to the MMR jab, the vaccine, in the UK. That research has been widely discredited and it's often cited actually as an example of poor research. You know, as I'm doing in this webinar, people refer to it in journal articles and things like that and say, and this is why we shouldn't rely on metrics because, you know, some, this has been cited hundreds and hundreds of times, doesn't necessarily make it a good thing. However, the more people that do that, the higher the citations go. So if you were to actually just look at the numbers, the citation numbers for this paper, they're astronomical, they're through the roof. So this shows that high numbers doesn't automatically equal good research. It could be for a variety of reasons. So altmetrics where you can drill down and sort of see the quality of the mention, see what people are saying about an output, that's gone some way to helping this, but there is unfortunately still some way to go. Next on the list we have potential bias. So there isn't any one metric, any one count that can capture absolutely every mention of what it's trying to measure. So inherently there's always some form of bias depending on the sources that are consulted. Some of the most well-known metrics are actually owned by commercial companies who will base the calculation only on databases that they own and they have access to, which obviously then limits the mentions of the work that it can reach. It can be really hard for researchers then to sort of go and verify the calculation behind a score and make sure that it's accurate. So they're being told that this is their, you know, their metric, their number, but can they actually go and work that out for themselves, especially if it's based on any kind of proprietary software or a database that they don't have access to that's behind some kind of paywall. Linked to this is the lack of consistency between metrics in general. So a researcher can get different scores using different measures as they're all based on these different sources. And that's the same for um, journal titles or institutions or, or book publishers or anything like that. On the sort of flip side of this, actually, a lot of metrics fail to take into account differences between disciplines and career stages. So you get a lot of metrics concentrated on journals. And I've talked about journals and journal publishing quite a lot so far. But obviously, there are some disciplines where journal publishing is quite a rare thing. They will go more for monograph publishing or conference presentations or something. And then you, you sort of you get a lower metric score, even though they're still doing well. It's just not being measured by the sort of metrics that people would recognize. There's also an argument that metrics that count things like citations and publication numbers, they're obviously going to favor those that are a later career stage and they've had more time to write more and build up their portfolio. So obviously their metric scores are going to be higher and this can disadvantage some early career researchers, especially if you're looking at the most popular metrics. If two people in a department, one has been working 10 years and the other's been working five years, and the one who's been working for 10 years has a higher metric score. That's maybe because they've been in the discipline longer rather than that they are a better researcher. There's also something that's known as the Matthew effect, where established researchers, sort of famous people, are cited because of their reputation. People will expect to see works by certain people or certain works referenced in literature reviews and things like that. And this increases their metrics slightly artificially, which only enhances their reputation further and is kind of a cyclical thing, and on we go. As well as these sort of genuine differences, it's, I think, quite important to acknowledge that there's a potential for gaming the system. Metrics can be quite easily manipulated. And although that's, that's frowned on, it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. So authors can self-cite their work, you know, they can cite themselves and then um, boost their count that way. They can get their colleagues to do it, especially if there's a subordinate um, relationship there. 
people within the institution can arrange to cite each other to boost their department metrics and things like that. And there's problems with um, things like gift authorship where somebody's working on a project and an output and they might add their supervisor's name to it to sort of give that output a bit of a boost, but also it then um, inflates the metrics of their supervisor even if they haven't done any work on the actual project. Perhaps one of the biggest problems with metrics is that they actually weren't intended to be used in the way that they currently are being used. So traditional bibliometrics were originally um, devised as a way for librarians to select which titles they wanted to stock in their library. So obviously if something was cited a lot by researchers in the department, it's going to be a good idea to have that in stock in the departmental library. If you think about the, the major life decisions that are now being based on these metrics, Many people have argued that they're not actually fit for purpose. And added to this is really the fact that most of these metrics have been around for some time. There are occasionally new ones that come in, but the established ones have been around for a while. And they haven't really adapted to changing methods of publication, despite things like op metrics. They are still very print focused and very journal focused. And people argue that this is a major problem. So now that we know what the problems are, one potential solution is the move towards the more responsible use of metrics in assessment. Rather than calling for them to be replaced or cut out altogether, the, the responsible metrics movement argues that they should be used in a more responsible way, including placing less of an emphasis on numbers and taking into account a wider picture of impact and the facts behind those numbers. Responsible metrics is not one single set of principles or rules, but it's more of a general move towards making sure that assessment is fair and robust. Several different groups and documents have contributed to the development of responsible metrics. And over the next few slides, I'm going to spend some time looking at three of the most important ones, DORA, the Leiden Manifesto and the Metric Tide Report. And then I'm going to come back and sum up the main points of all of those. So DORA, which is the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, was developed in 2012 following conversations at an American Society of Cell Biology meeting, where attendees got talking and found that they all had similar concerns about the over-reliance, as they called it, on metrics that were being used to assess their work. They were especially concerned that their work was being judged more on where it was being published than on its own individual merits and quality. So for example, the same paper would be judged as, as better and more important if it was published in a higher ranking journal than a lower ranking journal, even if the content was exactly the same. And they argued that this should not be the way things are. Together, they came up with the principles of DORA with different levels aimed at organisations, individuals and publishers. What you see on the screen is kind of a summary of all of those documents. Although this was developed by those that work in sciences, I think it's really important to stress that even the original group themselves said that this should cover all disciplines. They were trying to be general rather than specific. DORA is a document which anyone, so whether that's individuals, wider institutions, departments within institutions, anyone can sign up to demonstrate their support for the principles of responsible metrics. To date, when this webinar was recorded, over 14,000 individual people and 1,300 organisations have signed, and that includes all seven of the UK research councils who've signed up to DORA. Next to be launched was the Leiden Manifesto for Research Metrics, which, like DORA, was conceived at a conference by a group of social scientists and research administrators. The manifesto was released in 2015 in an article in Nature, and you can find that freely available online. And that outlined both the rationale and the 10 key principles of the manifesto, which you can see on the screen. Like DORA, the manifesto has had some high profile adopters from around the globe, including um, research institutions and major universities. The principles go into quite a lot of detail on how both researchers and their output should be measured, as well as stressing the importance of verifiable data. And that, if you know anything about open research, is a, is a key component of the wider move towards open research practices that you should be able to check the information underneath. 
The manifesto itself is currently under review, so it's been out for about four years now. And a lot of people have had a chance to comment and make suggestions for changes and things like that. So it's currently under discussion based on input from the wider research community and hopefully a, an updated version will be released in the next couple of years. The final uh, one I want to mention is the Metric Tide, which was released in 2015 as an independent report, which was commissioned by HEFKE, which is the now defunct Higher Education Council for England. This report was produced by a group of researchers from various disciplines and was designed to investigate the reliance on metrics ahead of the next research excellence framework, the next REF. The report advocated five key principles, which you can see on the screen, for responsible metrics and concluded that the general concern about metrics that people had been talking about was justified and that any future REF exercises should take into account qualitative measures of assessment to balance out any numerical measures of impact. So there isn't really time in one webinar to go through everything, all of those documents in detail, but these are some of the themes which are common to all of the documents and really the responsible metrics movement as a whole. Responsible metrics advocates a mixture of both types of impact to produce a more rounded picture of the influence of the person or the research or whatever it's measuring. Although numerical measures have a place, they should be complemented with wider me measures such as mentions of the research in the popular press. Obviously, tools like Altmetric have gone some way towards this, but there's still more work to be done to get that balance absolutely right. Linked to this is the general move towards um, open research and the methods used to calculate different metrics should really be open and available. So researchers should be able to see what the calculation is that's been used and work it out themselves and verify that this is correct. This enables researchers to audit metrics, better understand how they're devised, and just make sure that there's no gaming of the system. It's also a really, really important part of the wider move towards ensuring research integrity if you can go in and actually verify the data yourself. A key concern from researchers themselves is that the metrics achieved by a particular piece of research or a particular title are becoming more important than the findings themselves. So someone could, you know, release the cure for cancer, but if it doesn't get a decent score in the right journal, is anyone going to take any notice of it? Authors are under increasing pressure to publish in titles with the highest metric, but they're concerned that this means that the merits of their actual research are generally being overlooked. And there's also, I think, a need to consider the global nature of research. That comes across quite strongly in most of the documents and ensuring that research that's being done outside of what we know is the global north or what used to be called the developed world is judged equally on its merits rather than where it is published. So you might get an excellent piece of work um, written in South Africa, but if it's not, if they don't have access to the sort of high quality, high impact journals, doesn't mean it's bad research. It just means it wasn't published in a particular title and the metrics need to take that into account. I think it's also really important that uh, metrics consider a range of measures of any one research or institutional output because if you rely on only one metric that can give you a really really distorted picture of impact. Different measures as we've talked about will offer different results for the same output or the same person which can be really really confusing. Certain metrics are also often popular in particular disciplines and again this can create problems because everyone's striving to get a certain H index or get into a journal with a certain impact factor or something because that's what's expected in their discipline. I think it's important to consider a range of metrics to avoid relying on those which are biased at towards researchers at a more advanced stage of their career as well. So any metric needs to take into account all these differences that you don't just you're not just a researcher in the sciences or a researcher in the humanities. You have your own career path, you're at a different career stage, you might be producing different kinds of research. It needs to take this diversity into account. And finally, any metrics that are used should be regularly reviewed and updated to ensure that they're still fit for purpose. 
This offers a chance to go in and adapt them to take into account any developments in scholarly publication and output formats and things like that, which is something that not all existing metrics have managed to achieve to date. With the increasing emphasis on metrics and measurement in academia, issues like these are going to become more and more important. Different researchers and disciplines will be impacted in different ways, but since assessment really underpins almost all parts of the research life cycle, it's safe to say that all researchers will come across these problems at some point. So I thought it'd be a good idea to end the webinar by talking about what librarians and library staff can do to support their research community in this area and how you can advocate for responsible metrics. A lot of this obviously depends on factors like discipline, career stage, and how things operate locally in your circumstances, but there are some general principles that you can follow. On a practical level, you can obviously advise researchers to try and make sure that all of their work is linked back, linked back to a single authoritative source, like the, the final published version or a version that's in a repository, as this is going to help make keeping track of all the different metrics easier. So if you've got something stored in 20 different places that it's pointing to, then you're going to have to go around 20 times and add up all the numbers, where if it's only in one or two places, it's a lot easier to keep track. Working in a library, it's quite likely you'll be asked about some aspect of metrics at some point by a user. Although you don't need to know how each one is calculated, a vague awareness of what they are and how they work is a good idea, as well as some knowledge of areas like altmetrics. Once you've started talking to researchers about metrics and answering their questions, you can move on to advocacy. I would recommend actually trying some stealth advocacy here. So rather than going in giving them a talk like this about responsible metrics, I'd use general advice sessions about metrics to highlight responsible metrics as a whole, perhaps in the context of kind of wider conversation about impact and how they can share their work. It's important, I think, to advocate up as well as down. So talking to the research community is great because these are the researchers of the future. They can spread the word. They can um, understand what this is and be part of that conversation. But also, I think we need to educate those with the decision making power because they can have a greater influence. So if you have the chance, if you have the opportunity, talk to the, the higher ups in your library and your system and let them know that really decisions should be based on more than just metrics and give them outlines of the reasons why. Finally, one of the most important things you can do as an organisation or an individual is sign any of the declarations that we've discussed in this webinar. If you want to show your support for the principles of responsible metrics in general, you should consider signing and making that public commitment, that public declaration, and talk about it to people and tell them you've signed it and explain to them the reasons why. The more people who sign, the stronger the movement in general will grow. It's important to remember that responsible metrics, in the UK at least, are still at a fairly early stage and other countries like the US are far more advanced than we are. So perhaps the most important thing you can do to help support your researchers is to keep abreast of new developments, follow what's happening in the US, try and stay one step ahead and learn more about what the responsible metrics movement is, how libraries can support it and how you can advocate for change. To help you do this, we produced another one of our research support handy guides on responsible metrics, which is kind of a summary of the things we've talked about today and the general principles. These are guides which are aimed at helping librarians understand some of the key issues in research support, but also um, if you follow the link on the screen there, you can print them out to actually hand out to researchers or adapt them for your own needs as you like. Thanks for watching and watch out for more Wednesday webinars from the OSC soon.